You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Um, I'm really happy about the fact that our bookstore was just voted the best bookstore in Philadelphia. Thank you all for voting. And now Mainline Today also has its contest coming up, so if you can vote for that as well, that would be great. Um, today we're interviewing Sarah Gerard, whose uh, new book is Binary Star. It's published by a small but really wonderful uh, publishing house called Two Dollar Radio. And uh, also, Sarah's book tour, which is ongoing now, is funded at least in part by a, a Kickstarter project. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Also, why don't we, before we start talking about the book, why don't you talk a little bit about the process because your method of getting into the world through publishing is a little different than most of the other authors I've interviewed. Uh, well, uh, I, I wrote the book. Uh, I wrote the majority of Binary Star over the course of a month um, in a trailer in Florida about 20 minutes from my parents' house uh, in a little town called Largo. And I um, edited it, you know, myself about th three or four times before sending it out. And I began to send it out in September. And actually, by December, I had found um, a home for it, a $2 radio. Um, and they pulled it out of the slush pile, which is incredibly lucky. Um, but, you know, but I had sent it first around to a number of agents, and a lot of them told me they really loved the book, and they really, you know, they connected with it. They couldn't stop thinking about it, but they didn't know how to sell it, or it was too short, or didn't have one one agent told me that she didn't think it had enough paragraphs. <laughs> yeah, because I said if I could add more paragraphs, and I was like, no, <laughs> just, just not the kind of animal this this animal is. Um, I sent uh, I sent something but, I wrote to a, a publisher once, and they wrote, and I was really excited. They go, I really loved reading this. I was so drawn to it. It's really great. But what is it? <laughs> Yeah. And so I couldn't answer. And then they said, can you do something with it? I said, no, I, I don't know what it is. And a lot of it reminded me of your book, um, the way Binary Star combines this aspect, aspect of your body and how your body's image is and then juxtaposed against it is in the entire universe. And that's kind of mm -hmm. like what I was writing about, but it didn't make any sense. Yours makes makes sense to a certain extent. <laughs> oh, who, care, who cares about making sense? No, you shouldn't. <laughs> It's like I used to no, work. I was really, I was really not concerned with making sense. I, I, I mean, you know, the protagonist is highly irrational, and I, I really wanted that to come across. So, I'm glad that the book doesn't make sense in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Well, so anyway, so anyway, you got okay. So finally, um, they pulled it out, and you, like you said, you're lucky. It's like kind of winning the lottery in a, in a kind of a, a way, and then you get yeah. published. But it's this, you know, it's like the Dorothy Project. I just interviewed Nell Zink, who wrote um, The Wall Creeper. Oh, I just wrote about the Wall Creeper. It's an incredible book. Yes, it is. And she and I ended up being friends and talking all the time. Um, and I would send her things I wrote, and she'd write back, this is not nearly as bad as some of the things I read. <laughs> <laughs> that was her way of complimenting me. But anyway, yeah, and her new book, Miss State, is coming out in May. So. Oh, wow, that's so exciting. Uh, but so anyway, yeah, so, so the Kickstarter thing. Um, I, I looked at it and saw how much you raised and thought that was a great way to go about no, and I know you said in your interviews that you'd already planned all these places to go to, but you had to figure out how to pay for it, kind of like your book. Yeah, I, I made you know I made it uh, impossible for me, for myself, um, or rather I should say I, I made it uh, I made it impossible you know, for for myself to back out. I'm not sure if I'm saying that well, but you know yeah, you I, I, there was a lot at there was a lot at stake when we launched the Kickstarter project. Um, me, we being my husband and I, my husband is a filmmaker and. And uh, made the made all the videos and um, and you know I, I didn't want my I didn't want my first novel to disappear. I think uh, especially now um, you know a lot of authors find first homes for their works, especially works that are rather unusual um, with small presses. And the great thing about small presses is that they they have um, they, you know, they're made up of really small teams of people who are really dedicated to the work. And the really bad thing about small presses is that they're made up with really a really small team of people who are really dedicated to the work, and you know they they have uh, you know limited I think um, you know limited means of, of creating publicity for their for their books 
um, being that only a few people are doing the work. So a lot of the onus, and this is true at large press too now, a lot of the onus of, of publicizing books falls to the authors. Um, and luckily, having been a bookseller and um, working now in uh, magazine circulation, I have a lot of contacts at bookstores around the country, and I really love supporting independent bookstores. So I reached out to my friends, you know, uh, who are, who are independent booksellers and said, hey, can you help support my first book? And a lot of them said yes, and we're happy to schedule events. So, you know, I mean, I think I think that happens, I think that needs to happen a lot in the literary world, that people sort of band together and, and uh, make make really, uh, you know, make new authors visible so that we can keep writing fresh. I think, it, I think it works both alive. ways. I mean, with our bookstore, you know, having people, having authors there who aren't, in the mainstream, like John Franson or, or or Grisham or books that I, I I don't even like necessarily having in the bookstore, um, it's it's so nice for us because it gets us a new audience and people come mm-hmm. from downtown Philadelphia and yeah, it works both ways definitely. You, uh, Absolutely, I was at Powell's last night and you know the turnout for a debut author is small and I'm not I'm never disappointed when only a few people show up to the reading. I think there were like eleven people at the reading last night. Which is great, you know. A few of them were my friends, and and and, the, and a few of them were actually booksellers in, from the store. And I mean, it was, it's just it's, it's such a happy experience, you know, right. just seeing how enthusiastic booksellers are about books like Binary Star well, and, and getting to know them and know their you know um, know their tastes and you know uh, match match faces to names I've, I've seen on my computer screen. Yeah, it's and funny. Sign, sign books for the store. It's really fun. Yeah, and I and I sometimes like when we have a signing and not a lot of people show up. I get I feel bad for the author. I feel sad, you know, like embarrassed. And they're always really happy. Yeah. They're happy to be there. They don't care how many people are there. They love they're reading it. They love talking to you about it. And it, whether there's a, one person there or there's a hundred people there, they they always seem to enjoy it, and it always makes me feel good. Yeah, I mean, and there are, there are always at least a few new people in the audience. A few people I've never met before. That's that's, that's a few more people who might read my book. So. Right. <laughs> Good for me. <laughs> right, and hopefully that's what, you know, these kinds of interviews should do for you too. Well, so going back to the book. So well, one question I had was why why do you have before the first the first section, why do you have, why did you write the entire first section in it, italics? Oh, well, actually, I wrote the first section thinking that I would write the entire book in that style, and then <laughs> I realized that I would have to make these um, finicky little things called scenes <laughs> if I wanted the book to have any kind of plot. <laughs> um, but the first section was, was great, or is great, rather, I think, in that it sets up all of the major themes of the book, and it introduces you to the main characters, and it makes the conflict really clear. I mean, it's really only conflict in that first section. Um, there's not a whole lot of plot there. Um unless you count, you know, pacing in your apartment alone plot. Um, uh, but um, but, but I, I, I really wanted, I wanted the whole book to read that way. And then um, I, in, in my, in doing my research, um, I discovered, you know, uh, I discovered these things called dredge ups, which are phases in the life of, um, of a star in which the star dredges up core material and changes um, chemical composition and size and uh, the quality of the star changes. So, um, I, I thought that, and there are three of them, which I think sets up really well the three X structure. So um, I, I used that to sort of uh, organize the book um, when I realized that that I couldn't continue in the way that I was writing it. So, but I by that point had become really attached to the first section and offset it with the italics later on. Um, actually, in the in early phases of editing, it was right justified too. But then I sent it to a friend of mine and he said, hey, this is really confusing. I don't know why I'm having to read. You know, these, these first sections are already diff- um, difficult to read. So uh, I think you should just make it a little bit easier for me and less justify all this text. And if you really want to offset it, you can add italics. So I thought that was a good suggestion. Yeah, that, the whole thing actually worked out well thematically, I thought, and the dredge ups definitely because the book standing alone with regard to a human being or two human beings would have been fine. But the but the fact that you tied it so uh, inextricably to the idea of uh, fusion, or uh, you know, this the mm-hmm. center of a star being the biggest diamond in the world, and, uh, mm-hmm. and tying it to the Beatles and things like that. But how much did you know about astrophysics and the composition of stars and matter before you wrote this? I knew some things, and I was really happy to discover other things along the way. Um, I think. 
that I think that at the research, I think because I, I, I allowed myself to be open to um, to the plot uh, changing over time um, as I was doing my research, I, I became really deeply affected by a lot of the things I was learning about stars and was was willing to change the direction of the novel, um, you know, uh, several times while I was writing it because I, 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 I felt it sort of guiding me and in, in, rather I felt the material guiding me in certain directions that um, that really what's the word I'm looking for um, that were really intriguing to me you know and and I and I, I trusted I, I trusted myself to know what would be intriguing to a reader because it was intriguing to me so um, you know that sense of I think discovery and curiosity uh, was, was really easy to keep fresh while I was writing it and it's, um, so, so, which is to say that I knew some things and, and was really excited about learning more. I think it's a good place to be when you're writing. Well, it's, it's an area that's always fascinated me. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just, it, at first I looked at it, okay, this is a nice n- analogy. Okay, this is a nice metaphor. This is a nice extended metaphor. And then I realized, okay, this is a nice way of looking at the world. Because you're looking at the very, very, very biggest things. At the same time, you're looking at a person who wants to be the very, very smallest thing. And yeah. And then you yeah, weave. You're looking in. at a single. You're, you're looking at a single pound on a scale, and you're looking at something that weighs, you know, several thousand tons, or a million tons, a billion tons, a trillion tons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, and the thing about it is, you know, it's like ninety one, ninety two, and I can almost feel it. And I don't suffer from anything, but I can see how if you're one day you're ninety one, and the next day you're ninety two. Oh my God, that must be so horrible. And yeah, and it never ends. <laughs> it yeah. Never ends. It's it. And then it's full of drugs, but it's not. Your book is full of drugs, but it's not the drugs that would be normally in a book about drugs. It's these, you know, which I didn't even know about hydroxycut and, um, I, you know, obviously. Oh, it's probably better that you don't know about hydroxycut. <laughs> well, I did. Now I researched it and I looked at it. And I looked at what the FDA said about it, and um, well, t- so tell me. I mean, how much of this is about you, or is any of it about you? Well, I struggled with anorexia. For many years, um, anorexia and bulimia. I think the per- I first began counting calories when I was seven, um, which is a very young. It was and it was the same year that I started um, uh, self mutilating. Um, and, and it's not because anything traumatic happened to me as a child. In fact, I had a really happy childhood. Um, but I learned what uh, I learned what fat grams were when I was taking gymnastics lessons. Which is not to say that children shouldn't take gymnastics lessons. Um, but you know, but something in something something in me, uh, you know, led me to start quantifying, um, and uh, and then you know, and then it, it lost control when I was in college. I think for a lot of people who struggle with food, college is a really problematic time because you're only just beginning to feed yourself, you know, to take care of yourself independently um, without parental supervision, um, and uh, uh, you know. Um, and you're under all of this new, uh, all, all this new stress from school, you know, from um, from having to readjust your social world, um, and you're also probably doing drugs, like I was. Uh, but anyway, so a lot of this, um, you know, a lot of this, I think, came from my, came from my own life. Um, but what is it about it that? A lot that, of it is fictionalized. What is it about it that? Um... I mean, I know it's like telling someone, why don't you just be happy? Why don't you just eat more? Can't, you know, here, have some food. Those kinds of things are silly. Um, you know, if someone's self-mutilating, you, you why can't you, someone says to you, why, do, why can't you just stop doing that? You know, and, and that's a, a horrible thing to say to someone. But it, I remember when I was getting my first divorce and I was really depressed and I was smoking cigarettes. And then when I left, I didn't take anything and I weighed, I lost 40 pounds and I felt so light it, you know, I had mm. no possessions. I could walk, and I felt just really light, like my feet would almost be lifting off. And it was a really, really nice feeling. Yeah, sometimes starvation is euphoric. <laughs> sometimes it's hell. <laughs> but the, but to be um, at seven years old, though, there has to be a reason, I would think, that you decide that less is more. <laughs> um, nobody ever told me that it was better to be thinner, but I, I think I was, you know... Um, like all of children, picking up on a lot of cultural cues. Uh, I, you know, I, I idolized, um, you know, I because I was taking gymnastics, I idolized certain gymnasts, um, and uh, and you know, I, I played with Barbies and you know, yada yada. I mean, like, where does it come from? You know, it's it's uh, it's 
it's in, there are subliminal messages um, that that at the time I wasn't allowed to uh, I wasn't allowed to be critical of you know of not or not even not allowed to I, I wasn't I, just, I didn't even know that I could be critical you know well the, well, the um, th- interesting thing you do again in addition to <clears throat> talking about your relationship with John and how that's a binary relationship as well as with stars. You also add in the stuff that's really cool because it's so culturally culturally relevant. Like mm-hmm. the one section, and I'll just read from it, where you're talking when you're in the drugstore, um, when she's mm-hmm. in, not you, when she's in the drugstore, uh, and you know you see Christina Ricci and Nicole Christina Ricci, Nicole Ricci, Portia De Rossi, Mary Kate and Ashley, Misha Barton, Victoria Beckham, and you go on and on. Kelly Clark, Clarkson, Noli Allen, Karen Knightley, Lindsay Lohan, Lady Gaga, and you go on for a whole page. The Barbie twins, and then uh, uh, and then all the things you're you're buying to to continue to lose the weight, and then the the dog is asked if you want a candy bar for a dollar, and then your response, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you know, a lot of these things like 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 the Kardashians, for example, mm-hmm. and and her enormous butt, and Kanye going up to the podium and you know taking credit and trying to give the Grammy. I don't want those things in my mind. Why are they in my mind? I, I should have space for real things. It's taking up too much of my head. But mm-hmm. it's like you said, you, the culture is there and you're inundated with it. And it does. Yeah, there's no way, you know, I mean, it is, it is your, it's the setting of your, of your life, you know, it's your life as a story. I mean, somebody asked me the other day uh, about, about brand names in the book and how, you know, a lot of writers are really reticent to use brand names. And, uh, and for me, it's just setting. For me, it's just, it's just what, it's what my, my, my world is, is, is composed of, you know, and the same thing goes, I mean, I think in that, in that section that you, that you're referring to, um, I'll say two things. The first is that, is that I really like how sort of otherworldly a lot of those, um, diet pill brand names are. It's like you're, it's like you're reading the names of robots or something. <laughs> oh, I know. Plus, um, plus now when you go on the web and you go to any page at the bottom, you're going to have those advertorial things that say, like you do in your book, seven weird ways, seven scary right, ways. Yeah. And, you know, who are the people that actually press the buttons because they think there really are seven weird ways that you can do that or enlarge your penis or whatever it is, you know. Actually, that, that, that section that you're referring to, that uh, it's like a page and a half of just, you know. Yeah, that, that was great. Ar- articles about diet, about diet tricks. I just Googled diet tricks and, and, and copied and just copied out the first, you know, seven pages of my Google results. And those, I mean, right, just transposed them into the book. I mean, it, it's um, it's so easy. And then so many of them are conflicting, too. It's like, you know, which direction. It, it, it's, first of all, it's ludicrous to think that you, you know, that there are five easy ways to lose your, you know, whatever. I mean, and, and, and secondly, I mean, which of these, which of these articles are you going to, are you going to decide to listen to today, you know, um, some of them are really are, are really seasonally specific too. There were a few that, that didn't end up in the book, but they were like, you know, like uh, like seven like seven tricks to lose weight for a sexier Halloween. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, so I'll I'll change I'll change my whole lifestyle so that I can look sexier on on one on one, one day of the year. And I, I, it's um it's it's uh it's really uh. I don't know. It's just it's it's really it's a uh, it's it's really infuriating in a way. I mean, yeah, it I is. Just want to say, leave me alone. <laughs> leave well, me alone. Well, the fun the thing is that the theme of your the theme the overt theme of the book is okay. These two kids that are in love with each other but not in love with each other are are flawed, are damaged. Um, they they decide to go around the country and. The question I had from the beginning was, you know, I liked, I keep saying, I keep wanting to say you. I'm going to say it anyway. I liked you, <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't like John. And are you supposed to like John? Mm-hmm. Are you supposed to not like John? Are you supposed to feel sorry for him? Are you supposed to think he can be redeemed? Well, would you like the narrator if you weren't stuck, stuck inside her head? I, I, I don't know if I would like her very much. No, if I wasn't <laughs> stuck inside her head... I wouldn't like you. No, you're right. I would. It would be yeah. like John at the jukebox. Yeah. 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 In a way, I think the, the book is really unfair to John because you're never given his point of view. Um, he's never allowed to justify his behavior uh, like she is. And you know, I'm not even sure if she justifies her behavior, but she. Uh, she's sympathetic. She, she's sympathetic. She, exactly. Yeah. But I think only because 
you're you're with her the whole time. You you can't you can't escape her her irrational thinking. It becomes sort of your own. Um, uh, and I mean, and that I think that was one of the reasons why I didn't give her a name. You know, it's like you she could really be anybody. Um, right. Yeah, but you know, uh, I, I don't know if you're. I you know, I I tried to make John. Um, I tried to make John sympathetic at times. And uh, I used, I mean, at one point I was like, he has to save the cat, which is, you know, he, he has to save her from from what, what might otherwise be uh, a really disastrous situation when she's, there's one scene where she's at a restaurant and she's, uh, she, you know, she's she's had a beer and she's also been taking diet pills that day and she hasn't eaten for days and so she just gets really, really sick and throws up at the restaurant. And then he, you know, I mean, what else did he do but carry her to the car and give her water? Um but anyway, so uh, I'm not sure if that makes him a sympathetic character, but it makes him a little bit human, and I think that's the best that either of these two can hope for at a given time, you know. Well, it's just to, yeah. It's like someone saying everybody tries their best, and mm -hmm. they both do, I guess, try their best. And the other thing that you make, the other thing that you add in that has a certain subtext to it, especially for people as old as I am, is that that the, the trip they're taking is being financed entirely by John's parents and he's using the money yeah. to drink and to buy her presents that you know he's not buying and mm -hmm. there's a, a a visceral response to that from there will be from parents and things like that so you put that in there for a specific reason though i assume yeah i think john could probably benefit from some parental oversight <laughs> um <laughs> he needs some stru he needs uh, some structure in his life definitely <laughs> yeah of course yeah i mean i think her problem is that she's her life that she's her life has too much structure, and his has too little. One of their many problems, and, and, and one of the one of the many ways um, in which they're opposite, um, in which they're you know their their sort of identical illnesses are are, are binary opposites of each other. They are. Um, it's funny mm -hmm. because it's the way she's she's created this horrible exoskeleton that she lives inside of, and mm -hmm. and it's so funny that she's so excited that if that there. Are, the possibility that if she was in space, that she would lose all sense of who she was, of what species she was, of the world. Mm -hmm. And then you go over the actual situation with the cosmonauts, the one cosmonaut. And mm -hmm. yeah, she wants that. She wants she wants her breast to lift up because there's no gravity, and she wants <laughs> to look like Nicole Richie, whose clothes are vastly larger than she is. All those mm -hmm. things are really well done, by the way. Thank you. But, um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think, and this is my own fantasy, which I think made its way into the book. Sometimes I think it would be so nice not to be human, you know, to, to have, uh, you know, to have the point of view of someone without. Actually, this this, this comes from. Um, I'm a big fan of Clarice Lispector, and her book, The Passion According to G.H., uh, is one of my favorites. And uh, and over the I don't know if you've read it, but over the course hmm. of that book, she sort of strips away all of the all of the boundaries. Um, that we take for granted, you know, down to the fact that we're human, you know. I mean, I think beginning with her, her social, her socioeconomic, the character's socioeconomic class in the book, and then the fact that she's female, and then the fact that she's, uh, you know, a white female, and then the fact that she's human at all, um, until it's just, until she, she is, she is, she sees this, not only the similarities, but sees that, that her matter is identical to the matter of the inside of a cockroach. Um, and it's a really, uh, Sort of intoxicating. I, I some people find the book challenging, but I love it. I can't. I, I can't put it down. And I think that's sort of what I was trying to achieve in that um, with that image of you know of, of losing your sense of, of, of humanity. Um, is that you know is that all the matter in the cosmos is is the same? Yeah. Well, that's exactly what you do because in describing stars and like degenerate activity in stars, all. All the an you you anthropomorphize the universe. Isn't that weird? You anthropomorphize the the universe to lay it on top mm -hmm. of the skull. And that's the other reason why she's so sympathetic is because she's really smart, and mm -hmm. and she knows all this stuff. And that's really a turn on for me is the fact that she knows all these things about the life of stars and and um, uh, the idea of when a star has fusion, when a star is not burning, the sing singularities and the way there's a red shift, and then the way there's a red shift and a blue shift because it's going back and forward. And mm -hmm. and, and the poster she has of this main, the main sequence, what's it called, the main? Yeah, the main sequence. Yeah, yeah all mm -hmm. those things are really attractive, I, I, mm -hmm. I find. 
Did you? Too, you... Bad. Too bad she can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Well, you know, but yeah, the, does the universe have self-esteem? You know. <laughs> well, the scientific method can't help her, can, can it? I mean, you know, uh, I'll, you know, all of this. I think all of this information adds up to to what you know. If uh, if on a on a on an existential level, she has no, you know, she has she has no idea what she's worth. I mean, <laughs> she she does. She has an idea of what she could be worth. It's just a perverted right, idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, but I think she also has, you know, she's, her, what she wants is very conflicted. I mean, she wants, she wants not to want what she wants to, you know, she knows how, yeah. how ridiculous her, her goals are, um, but that's the addiction. Well, that's like in the right? first, first couple of pages where she says this and then she goes, no, I'm a, li- I'm a liar. And, uh, mm-hmm. and it's those, mm-hmm. those contradictions that occur frequently throughout the book, you know, mm-hmm. they make her a very unreliable narrator. And mm-hmm. that's always intriguing yeah. in the book. Yeah. Which I think is another reason why the, the book isn't really fair to John, you know, because all of her perceptions are, are uh, of, of him, I think, are, are a little bit unfair, maybe. Not all of her perceptions, but sometimes, you know, I think mean, so we can we can rely on her reporting only in so much as we know it's, it's skewed in her favor. Um, and, uh, and, and we know that she's, she's lying on the way to John, which influences his behavior, too, but is lying to us. Um, well, especially those situations where he's around nice people, especially her friend, and then mm-hmm. acts like a complete, you know, ass, and mm-hmm. and th- those also really turn you away from him because these people are nice people and they don't understand and they get exasperated really quickly with his behavior, which means that she's losing friends at the same time as he's insulting people for no reason at all. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, she's she's very much alone. How can and, you, you know? It, I was going to say, how can you be so young and think of all this stuff? How can she be so young and think no, of all this you, stuff? No, you. You as an author. Oh. What's, going, oh. what's going through your head? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, well, I, I think it's taken me a long time to be able to write about this. I have been, I've been in recovery since I was 22 and never really thought that, uh, that my eating disorder was something that I should be writing about. I thought that it was silly and, and cliche and, yeah. you know, just another girl writing about her eating disorder, which is actually, I think, something worth thinking about. You know, how, why is it that, that, that such, such widespread, or rather such, com- such a common experience of suffering is something that women think they can't write about? Um, uh, or, you know, why is that, why is that a cliche? Uh, I don't, you know what? Like a, a girl with an eating disorder. I mean... Part of it's but, uh, the problem but, you describe. Another another good scene is when, when John's you know passed out and the truck the uh, hunters pull the car out and they say what's your boyfriend's a sissy and you don't like steak you're crazy and I like the way she says thank you and, I, and he goes <laughs> I mean I mean you're really crazy thank you um, yeah I mean that's I think that ties back to what you were just saying I think that people have this perception, like I was talking about earlier, well, just eat, you know, just here, I'll make you something to eat. No, I don't want something right now. I just ate. And all the lies you have to make. And Oh, yeah, all of her excuses are right there at her fingertips. Yeah, and those are probably excuses I guess you've used many times. Oh, I yeah, assume. of course. Yeah. Of course. Well, so in all I your mean, pictures... Yeah, I... Go ahead. Sorry. Hmm? Go ahead. No, I'm no. sorry. I was just going to say that I, I, I used all of them <laughs> and more. But then if you look, if you Google you and look at all your images, you look like really pretty and really f- filled out. I mean, you don't, I mean, you know, really attractive. You don't look like... Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, you do. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't look, I mean, obviously, so things are fine. Are, but is it like, yeah, al- well, is, is it like alcoholism? Like you're always recovering? I think about food. Actually, the other day, my husband said, "I'm so tired of thinking about food so much. I think about food a lot, um, but I, I think I think about food uh, as, as something that nourishes me now. And I and I think about how um, I think about how my food is operating uh, in the world as an ethical force. You know, I, I want I want to be kind to myself with my food, and I want to be kind to the world with my food um, because in the past I, I haven't been." Um, well, well, that... And n- not only because in the past I haven't been, but also because just you know uh, it's I, it's it's important to me. Um, I assume fine. that means that l- unlike what the hunter suggests, that you're not going to have a big juicy steak, right? No, I don't. Uh, I don't eat meat. <laughs> I don't eat animal products at all anymore. 
Okay. Um, I, I did for a long time, but actually I think that, that because I'm going vegan again was a really important step in my recovery because I, I think of vegetarianism as a feminist issue and I, I think of it, uh, I, I think of, of, of it, um, I think of, of kindness uh, with regard to my food as, uh, as something that I should be considering for my, in, in terms of my own recovery at all times. You know, is this food good for me? Is it good for the planet? Um, and just acknowledging that my body is, is, a, is a continuous part of the, the animal kingdom, you know, and that if I, if I am violent with my food, then I'm being violent with myself too. Well, when you're so, talking about, um, like in the book, when you're talking about like 7 billion chickens and about the, the male chicks being chopped up and all yeah. that. But, but okay, so you're doing what you're doing, your part. The thing about my life, it's always been like, you know, I can put the towel, I can use the towels again at the hotel, even though they're doing it just to make money. Mm-hmm. I can do all these things, but it just it doesn't, there's no way anything I do, and I know this is such a, again, cliche thing, but there's nothing I can do that's actually going to change anything. Purdue chickens are still going to be in the 12 by 12 box for their entire lives. Well, I don't think that's. I don't think it's true that one person can't make can't can't make widespread social change, um, and uh, and and I I think it's also worth thinking about how many how many animals' lives you you won't be responsible for if you if you choose not to eat meat, um, and you know and it's also you know the truth is that food is very very personal. You know I mean you have to be. You have to be comfortable with your food choices, uh, you know, uh, all on your own. You know, consider taking all of your issues into consideration. For me, this is the right thing to do. Um, for you, it might not be. Oh, know? no. I and was just I, playing a part there. I mean, I agree with you. And oh, I, yeah. It's yeah. just that I'm not, you know, I can't be a perfect person. And so I always oh, have not. these frustrating well, feelings. Yeah. I actually think that perfection should never be a goal for anyone. I mean, that's, that's one thing that I, I come down hard on. You know, I, I won't tell you what to do. With your with your food, but but profession should never be your goal. Um, but also, you know, I mean, I, I think about, uh, you know, I mean, when you, with images like you know, like like seven seven billion dead Purdue chickens. I mean, how is that appetizing for anyone? <laughs> Why would that make me want to eat? <laughs> there's there's a you know, good docu- in There's a good documentary mm-hmm. that's narrated by Paul McCartney. I'm sure you've seen it. That t- talks about all that, and you know, very graphically. And you're right. I mean, it's just. It's absurd. Yeah. Actually, there's one. There's one narrated by Joaquin Phoenix that, that I, I yeah that really changed me too. But um, I, but anyway, and it's called Earth Life, Spring Lake. It's a really difficult, really difficult document. I can't say that I would recommend it, but um, just because it's really graphic. Um, but anyway, that that has been. I mean, keeping these things in mind at all times, I think is is really important for me. Um, and, uh, and and doing continuous research, just being informed, you know, what is healthy for me, what's healthy for the planet. Um, that's, those, those are never wrong questions to ask. What's what's and all that's really nice, but it's what's really good about the literary aspect of, of your book is that there's so much more. Like even like when they're driving along the road and they're saying, you know, why does Pandora why does Pandora cost money? Well, I guess they have mm-hmm. to do it. And you know, that's that's something that people think about that, you know. Things like Skype and Twitter and Match and Chemistry and Facebook and all these things that are contributing to this set of cultural memes that mm-hmm. you deal with com- com- constantly in the book. And um, it, I think it's very informative because I don't think people stop and think about stuff, you know, hey, why does Pandora cost money? Or just little simple mm-hmm. things like that. Or like. Well, Pandora doesn't cost money because it helps pay the artists, you know, and that's, that's I think that's it. An interesting situation too. Pandora costs. Or there, are, there are advertisements on Pandora because it pays employees at Pandora. The artists aren't making any money. Well, yeah, and then you can pay Pandora and not have ads. But um, right, exactly. But um, but the, at the same time, and you also, I mean, that's okay. That's Pandora. And then at the same time, mm-hmm. your book is talking about Nemesis, this theoretical uh, planet that Death orbits. Star. Yeah, the Death Star. And, you know, I've always thought of Nemesis and, you know, whether it exists or not, which it doesn't, but still it's a nice thing to yeah. think about, a cool thing to think mm-hmm. about. So you're really going from this tiny, tiny thing to this gigantic thing over and over again in the book. Thanks. I actually like, you know, I think I think Nemesis is a little, was like a, a little private joke for me just because, I mean, who, who doesn't know that it's not, nobody knows about Nemesis and thinks that it's real. I mean, but, uh, but, it, but, I mean, but it does have this, it, it does have this really curious name. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and I mean, and the, you know, it's it's a pendant story. I think is, is what this came in really handy um, in the book. And, and I, I think a lot of that when I was doing the research, a lot of a lot of why things came to be included in the book um, had to do with their with their language and with the you know the stories surrounding these these objects. I mean, it wasn't like I would do celestial objects. It wasn't like I set out looking for something that would be, you know, perfect right here. <laughs> um, it was just something that I happened across and said, oh, wow, that's really interesting and totally true. <laughs> Yeah, and like with Nemesis, it's great because you know what that you know what it means is you know you, your mortal enemy, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and also something that you could just be imagining, right? Right, exactly, and yeah. th- and then that that ties back. I mean, it really is a really interesting thing you've woven together because that ties back again to what she believes, and you're mm-hmm. there you're there with her in the living room while she's standing there, and and she mm-hmm. she likes to stand and not sit. Because mm-hmm. that way she can burn more calories. And you know, the other mm-hmm. thing that was really interesting was the fact that, and I guess I knew it, but I never thought about it, was that you burn more calories eating cold food because you have to heat it up in order to digest it. Yeah. Which I never even thought yeah, about. Yeah. Well, I don't want, you know, one of the things that I was really afraid of when I was writing the book was for somebody to read it for like, you know, tips, for like tips and tricks. You know, I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, some of her, some of the anorexic method- methodology is, is there in the book, you know. I mean, like, there are things that you, if you were a very sick per- person, could, could use to hurt yourself. And I really hope that all of the all of the horror of the situation comes across as well so that nobody reads it like, a, reads it like an instruction manual. That's no, really, I, don't, I do not think this is, I really, no. I don't think this is a book yeah. like How to Build a Hydrogen Bomb. <laughs> right. <No. laughs> but... Uh... Yeah, but like, you know, for the first time out, and I know you've, you know, done other writing as well, but I think this is, you know, a really good, and, you know, just the fact that you were able to, generally, okay, an author finds an agent, the agent finds a publisher, and the author can then vet the covers and stuff like that, but here you had to do everything on your own, and still are, and uh, mm-hmm. so it's like, you know, yeah. Well, there is, there has been, there has been help from $2 Radio, and I, and I, I have an agent now who is, you know, shopping the book around to international markets and and is doing some some publicity work as well so after talking about all this um with regard to what i consider you know a multifaceted book that you know and again it like you said it's it's um short and um and it's a first try but it's got so many aspects in it and the fact that you know like we talked about earlier just juxtaposing the idea of the universe and astrophysics and the the theory behind the main sequence and stuff like that, along with this story uh, of two people that are dysfunctional in a way, um, it's a really a very insightful way of, you know, beginning your career as a novelist. And one of the things you said in one of your, your interviews is, why would someone write one book and then stop? So what are your plans mm-hmm. for the future, given that? Well, um, I'm collecting my essays right now. Um, I'm also an essayist, and uh, I, I've... I've organized the collection around uh, around the idea of tracks, um, tracks being, you know, uh, open for interpretation, animal tracks, train tracks, track marks, you know, musical tracks, tracking devices. And um, I've uh, I've got a good number of those essays uh, have, have been finished um, and published, and uh, and some of them have been published, but I'll be expanding upon them, expanding them. Um, and then uh, I've got you know a good number that I have yet to write, but that are you know that are attendant with this theme. Um, and then I'm also working on another novel um, that's set in my hometown. I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Florida, and uh, was always really um, was always really involved in, in wildlife down there. I I think the I think the Florida wildlife um, is is just one of the most special ecosystems that there that there exist on this planet um and actually so many different ecosystems there are, you know there are uh um, wetlands and you know mangrove forests and uh and um i i when my husband and i go down there he's always really surprised to hear people just naming off animals and naming off plant species and you know he's like what kind of bird is that i'm like it's a roseate spoonbill <laughs> you know Oh, um, Rosie at Spoonbill. That's my brother and my favorite bird. And I used to live in okay. Florida. I went to the University of Florida, so I lived in Gainesville for years and years. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, we used to go to Gainesville for punk rock shows all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know exactly where you went. It was called the Great Southern yeah. Music Hall, but now I don't know what it's called. 
Yeah, it right. was, on, I mean, it was yeah. on University. Mm-hmm. Island, my favorite yeah. band. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. where Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers started. And I saw them before they were actually Tom Petty. That's how old I am. And uh, <laughs> the Eagles and mm-hmm. even Stephen Stills from Crosby, Stills, and Nash went to high school there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really cool place, actually. Yeah, well, anyway, I, anyway, so yeah, I th- I, I th- I'm really pleased. I normally, you know, there's a good chance I wouldn't have uh, read this. It's just that, it, it, you know, it actually came in as an arc from from your press, which is great that they actually sent it out to yeah. me. And that's why yeah. you're here. So anyway, yeah, I'm I'm very happy for you. I think there's great things in your future. And thank you so much for being here today and talking to me about your book. This was really fun. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Star was a great book, um, a great first novel. And as we talked about, it just weaves together so many different themes in such a short amount of space. And, um, she's a very precocious young woman in her 20s. Um, in summary, the book is, like I said, she who had an eating disorder is still recovering from it. It's not a cliche-ish book. It deals with it in a, com- in a completely different fashion, one which I think is fascinating. So I think it's a great book to read. Uh, upcoming guests include William Nicholson, who's going to join us to talk about his new novel, Amherst about Emily Dickinson, and Emily Dickinson's brother, who had an affair with um, his best friend's wife, and then they used as their assignation place Emily Dickinson's dining room, (laughs) and Emily Dickinson would listen through the doorway, which I don't know if all this is true or not, so I have to finish reading the book and then ask the author. Um, But as always, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to uh, having you here next week Uh, on, on this, The Avid Reader. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.